Okay, so a little bit more about myself and probably why Fabio invited me here. Uh, I started in 2014, March, a, a former student of mine uh, and I co-founded Projected Talent. And this was uh, a platform where uh, college students could find, uh, can connect with employers for short-term work. So you might have an assignment that you have more work than you could handle, but you don't want to hire somebody full time. You don't want to have an intern around for 10 weeks. Intern is a familiar yeah. term? Yes. Okay, so you don't want an intern for 10 weeks, but maybe you could just uh, dump off some of your work uh, for eight hours, 10 days, a, a week, or, or whatever. So that was the startup, and uh, I started that with uh, two Microsoft software engineers. They were the tech. I was the, uh, as an educator, I kind of knew the students and um, what they could do and what, what we could try to try to offer. Um, did I tell enough about myself? Can I talk about the startup or should I give you more <laughs> personal <laughs> stuff? Okay. Mix, it, mix it up, yeah. Manach. Um, You're cheating, but it's fine. I'm cheating. <laughs> okay, I'll go back to the kids. Uh, so, so I'll go back to myself. Before I go back to the startup, uh, so I teach marketing, uh, introduction to marketing, so just all the, the basics of identifying your target market, knowing what they want, um, and then coming up with a positioning that's different from your competitors and executing on that. So that's what I teach. Of in pricing, right? uh, yeah, and then my expertise is, uh, the other classes I teach is, is pricing, and so that's what my research and teaching is about. Uh, and a lot of people think pricing is just a number, um, but I, I talk about it for 10 weeks, I could talk about it for 20 weeks if they let me. <laughs> um, pricing is about so much more, it's about understanding who does that number go to? So uh, you want to charge maybe Fabio uh, in Rio a different price than me in Seattle, um, and maybe you want to charge uh, different prices, uh, and you want to identify who gets those different prices, and how do you make them both happy uh, that, that, that they're, they're paying different prices but, but getting what they want. Uh, so I teach pricing um, and do research in pricing, and I guess that's all about me. Uh, let's get to... Um, projected talent and, and my story and, and what I learned that I think might help you um, whatever you do whatever startup endeavor you do so uh, things were great March 2014 teamed up with a Microsoft software engineer a former student of mine uh, he was an evening MBA student brilliant guy he brought on another friend of his uh, who was also a Microsoft software engineer so there were two of them working full-time I had my job at the University of Washington and uh, was helping out and, and a part of this. And very quickly in May, we won a business plan competition. So we write up uh, what we're gonna do. We actually start testing the idea a little bit and we, met, we earned $25,000 uh, US um, winning that business plan competition. That brings a lot of excitement from investors and they start, uh, we, they start trying to beg us to take their money and my, my Co-founder says, "Ah, you know, we'd have this conversation. Um, I don't know if you're going to film this. That's kind of embarrassing. But uh, after we won that business plan competition, we'd have like a daily or weekly, like, what would it take for you to walk away right now? And, and we're like, oh, I'd need to make 50 million for the company. I would just need 10. Uh, and like every week, that number would would get higher and higher. Um, and so." Uh, investors wanted us to take their money. We finally come up to an agreement with, uh, a, a, in the US, I don't know how, how it goes here, you get a, an angel, do you have angel investing? Yes. Okay. So you, the angel, they, you have one who takes, he's the deal lead, uh, he or she, in this case it was uh, Kabir, was the deal lead, and then he goes around, vouches, does all the vetting, and then brings together a team of people who's gonna throw their, their money. Uh, so we had an agreement with the deal lead after quite a bit of back and forth to uh, what's called a convertible note. Is that what you were just talking about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we had a convertible note, wh which meant they gave us money, or they were going to give us money, sorry. They were going to give us $400,000. And for $400,000, that meant that over a certain spec specified amount of time, we either paid that back or they had the option to convert that to shares at whatever the price was um, at when we raised our next round. And so we had what's called a $3 million cap. So that meant that if we 
at our first round where they actually go through all the venture capital and all the careful vetting of the, kind of the more the stuff probably you were talking about that you're trying to avoid um, once you get to that if we were worth six million they would still get the shares based off of us being worth three million so that's what our three million dollar cap was now if we had a down round and we were going to raise at a you know 1.5 million dollar valuation then they would have a bigger chunk of our company um, so I couldn't understand I, I loved the passion that I saw it was really entertaining to kind of see uh, and Fabio said that I was like you guys are arguing right there's a real violent debate here um, but no just the, just the passion you guys have it's, it was cool um, is that how that is that what the conclusion of what yeah, you're developing? The word discussing uh, actually doesn't convert directly. Okay. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, the legal system in Brazil, and that's actually the main topic of conversation, is uh, a lot tougher. Okay. Uh, on startups, and um, one of the topics that we were discussing uh, was how to change that and yeah. what we could do, but it's. It's mostly the same things that you're talking about. We have the convertible notes here as well, okay. but the, all these are instruments that are very expensive to use in the Brazilian legal system. I see. So it's not uh, usable for every startup. Yeah. So in the U.S., uh, kind of the normal progression if you're going like the go big and, and go fast is you get this convertible note, uh, and that's just money and that doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything and it's really pretty easy you could get that done a lawyer could put that together for a couple thousand dollars and uh, ours was going to do that for uh, in exchange for future payment uh, so he did that for free uh, for us so we draw off that contract and then you get to venture capital and then pricing the rounds and then that gets really uh, expensive for the lawyers and expensive in time and and all the craziness there so we got to that first step. We were really thrilled, and we got it probably faster than we, we should have. Um, and that's kind of one of the lessons I'll, I'll give you, is never get, don't do that to yourself, where you're saying, how much would it take to walk away? And you're like thinking that you're like uh, doing so well, because we had investors ex excited about us. We had students excited about us. So as I said, we connected students to employers. And we had employers we, we heard what we wanted to hear, and they would all say, I wish I had that when I was a student. That's the greatest idea ever. And so we thought we had the greatest idea ever, and we were not keeping track of the fact that nobody was using this greatest idea ever. Um, everybody thought it was great for either a previous life of theirs or for some other company or for somebody else. Um, and we were blinded by this shiny light of, wow, these investors believe in us, um, and we never quite quite kept track. So that was like the conversation started in September. We had a, an agreement in place for the convertible note. We had to go fill the round, go get the, the people who are going to give us the money. And that was uh, not as fast as my co-founder thought it would be. So that started in September, came October, became November, and we still didn't have that deal finalized. And so he'd spent two months working on this deal, not working on getting customers, and then he just quit. Uh, so co-founder quit, the other guy quit, so they left um, and started their own other thing. And so it was me in December with all these positive signals that, hey, uh, investors want to give us $400,000 with basically very little. Um, you know, I, we almost had a partnership with, we had partnerships coming on with two universities, so Northwestern University and the University of Washington. So we had partnerships lined up. So I had all these bright and shiny lights. So I, I kept going as far as I could. Uh, and then I finally gave up uh, March of 2015. So the experience was, was one year. Um, so number one thing that I, I would say that I learned from it is set, uh, I guess there's two main things that I, I know for sure I want to share with you, is one, set goals. Um, and we kind of convinced ourselves we didn't need to set regular goals because we said, we've never done this before. We don't know what, what's good. We don't know what's bad. We don't have any benchmark because we think we're so, so new and different. Um, but that was a problem because I kept going with the same information that my co-founders quit 
with the same information. So for me, I thought this is great. For them, they thought this is bad. And we were never really learning which, which path we were on. Um, so we started to near the end, but it was a little too late. So I would set, I, I actually recommend weekly goals. And I know that's kind of silly, but even just one thing that you want to make sure that happens some uh, input output. So you could say, okay, here's my 10 weeks, but here's my one week and something didn't go right. So why, why didn't it go right? And what, what, what should I change about it? Um, Number two is don't take a, a product focus. And I didn't think I had a product focus because I thought uh, my customers are the students, but my customers were the students and the employers. So the students essentially became my product. And I, was, I knew all that the product could do, but as a professor um, who hadn't hired students, I didn't know what it's like to have to have a job uh, that you're hiring people and you've got the deadlines that are a little different than the way academia works. So I didn't really understand the employer side and those were my customers. Um, so I think my recommendation is everything starts with the customers. Don't fall in love with your product. Uh, your product is a way to make your customers happy and so you need to understand what what does your customer need? What will make them happy? And then you build that product and ch build the message accordingly. So number one, set goals. Um, number two, if I could do it all again, I would spend more time really understanding the customer. Customer first, and then the product satisfies uh, the need. Um, number three, there was uh, one of the best advice that I got and took a while to listen, but I, I finally did. Um, so a, a, a guy who's he's real big into technology, uh, he's convinced that technology is going to ruin, like change the world. He calls it make it all better, but I call it ruin because he says technology is going to do everything that we do and we're just going to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Um, so he's a big technology guy and he said, if you don't have a need for your product without technology, if you can't do it for that first customer with pen and paper, then you're, you're not really solving the need. Technology is how you scale, um, but you should be able to do it without technology, at least as you prove your concept and as you understand your customer. So I was like, oh no, Uber, that's all about the technology and and you know you got to have such a great interface and all that he says no uber is basically a, a cab and the question is are you can you get somebody from one place to another people will pay for that if you could bring them somebody if you could you know just look at the guy standing on the street waving a cab for somebody that's what uber is that's that's the the low tech way uh, and now uber makes that possible for more people <laughs> in more places um, so if you can't do it by hand f for one person, um, then maybe technology isn't, uh, isn't as, as necessary as you might think. Um, so that was something that, that really hit me because as a marketing guy and in a co-founded with two engineers, I kept saying, the reason nobody's using this is because of your fault. Uh, you need to make this interface better. The, the, and uh, ultimately that, that really wasn't the problem. We should have been able to do projected talent with an Excel sheet. Um, I should have been able to say, hey, F Fabio, what do you need? Tell me what kind of student you need. And then I should be able to take that Excel sheet, Excel sheet and say, look, here's my list of students. Fabio, here's your student. And then technology is going to make me do that for 100,000 instead of um, you know, one or two. So those were like the three biggest lessons. Technology is not really the answer, uh, you, you got to be able to do it without technology. C customers first and uh, set goals. And um, yeah, with the technology, th th that guy, one thing that stuck with me was, you know, go as far as you can, see what breaks and then fix it. Um, so don't build things before you kind of figure out 
that that's what the customer needs, that's what the customer wants. Um, so I thought I'd pause there because I don't know if I'm speaking too fast or, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I thought I'd take questions. Did anybody have a question about any of those three pieces of information I said or about the story of the company or anything else that I learned along the way? Yeah. Are you still, uh, are you still developing startup as an entrepreneur or now you're just, uh, you're just teaching? Uh, I, at this point I just teach. Um, one of the things I learned, so it, it takes a, a certain wiring and I've got part of it. The part I have is a curiosity. Uh, the part I have is like the desire to forge my own path. Uh, the part I don't have is not knowing if I'm going to eat uh, tomorrow <laughs> um, or the next day. Say it takes an obsessive personality. To yeah. Make it work. Uh, so if I could take a more of an advisor role, like I love that part of it, but that brief time where it was all on me and somebody said, oh yeah, this is great. I'm gonna get you some pitches and you know, maybe we could raise, like you could raise like a million dollars and it's so cool. And then and he's like, yeah, and then that's, you know, that's gonna be a lot of work, that's five years. And, and I was like, oh man, wait a minute. So I could get that million dollars, think I've got something, but that could go to zero just as fast as it could go to my $10 million exit um, that we were dreaming about early on. Uh, for this company, the only difference it would have done is brought other people who are more experienced than our team was at delivering solutions to customers, and that might have helped us crack the nut, um, but I don't think we were the right team to do it because we did not understand the customer who was the employers were really the customer and I I had never I, I hired academics I had never hired students I had never hired um, I never managed a group of people um, my co-author my co-authors my co-founders they just did code and so they never hired a marketing intern or anything like that and so I don't think we could have done it um, and I I don't think it was the greatest idea. I think everybody said it was such a great idea because they wished that when they were students that they could have gotten experience. Um, but I don't think anybody really said, I wish that if, when I'm hiring students that I could hire 10 <laughs> instead of one. Um, and that, that was a problem. I have a uh, question <coughs> related to that is, if you had partnered with a company that does temporary positions, yeah. temporary staffing, maybe they will have more knowledge about corporate customers and how they deal and everything, it would be a good yeah. partner for you guys. So we thought about that, so I actually looked out to them, uh, and there's, <coughs> I don't know if, I apologize if I'm just being ignorant of, of the, how many, how few or how many cultural differences or legal differences are. Uh, we've got temporary staffing firms, as he's saying, that they uh, will farm somebody out, pay, get paid by the hour. Um, and I tried to partner with them, but they, uh, they said, look, my margins, I, I farm somebody out at $150. You're looking at a student who's maybe 15, 20 hours. So I either need volume, where I'm just getting tons of people and it's super easy so like um, I, like the uh, the security contract that the uh, Rio Olympics had uh, that then fell through but uh, you know hey I need somebody to just get me all these bodies all at once that's going to be worth it because you're bringing a lot of people low paid um, but college students was never going to be a bunch of people at one contract and it was never going to be a lot of money per person so they didn't want to touch it which made me start to think should I touch it um, <laughs> But we had this vision, so, and I, I know a lot of people have it, uh, so we're not alone. And we got wrapped up in it, and it could happen to anybody because I, I teach not to do this. But uh, we had this vision, if you build it, they will come, right? So we thought, we have this platform, and we're gonna make it seamless, and then we're just gonna tell everybody, hey, students, here's 
what you could do. Hey, employers, here's what you could do. And they would just, it would just happen on the site. The technology would, would do that. Um, Maybe the problem was the country, because in Korea and Japan, there's a, a, a huge market for, for, for this, this kind of opportunity. So. Yeah, uh, there was a company in Australia that did it. Um, I think they're done. Uh, there was another company that did something similar. And here's where I think they, like, it also teaches you just subtle differences. A little twist can make a big thing. So I, we only focused on career relevant work. So we said, if you're a student, we're going to put you in a cool job, uh, whether it's a small project. It's, it's going to be career relevant. It's going to help you become uh, the next superstar. And this other thing said, we're going to get you any job. And then that aggregated all the students. So they got so many students, because students, I didn't realize, were afraid to do a job and not do it well. So they would actually rather work at um, a gas station, a cafeteria. And so they'd rather take these meaning, meaningless jobs. And so they actually got a lot of funding, and they got a lot of traction, because they aggregated all the students with any job. And then they were making money off of getting people into a bartender job. And we weren't making that kind of money. This is, did you try to benchmark with these companies? We all started at the same time, and that's oh, kind of when I quit. In the beginning also. Yeah, they started actually two months after <laughs> I did. That could have been us. Um, and, and this is answering your question before: Am I still involved in the startup, in startups? Um, not as like a founder, because even hearing their story, I don't wish that I could switch roles with them. So that was like a good gut check. Like they've got seven million dollars in funding, probably more by now. I, I stopped paying attention because it did kind of hurt <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but they have so many more obligations, and and uh, that can go to zero. Thing, um, during the negotiations, uh, which are your most important legal risks or legal um, problems? Uh, with the investors, yes. or with your partners, with investors. Oh, so. We in the U.S. have. Oh, uh, I, let me just compliment that. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if actually when I talented the panel, right? Yeah. I was wondering what were the consequences for you guys as founders? Zero. So that, that's uh, so there's a in the U.S. There's a limited liability corporation. So so far zero. I'd imagine it. Hopefully it stays <laughs> that way. It's as well, but we're talking about the disregard of the legal entity. Okay. okay. But a judge can rupt it. Yeah. With this theory of the disregard of legal entity. Uh, as far as I know, it's fairly difficult in the U.S. to what they call pierce uh, the corporate veil. Okay. Uh, so, to be honest, and I, it might, I th it seems like it might be very different here, but the mentality for a startup in Seattle is we don't have anything for anybody to want, uh, and until we do we're not really that worried. Uh, our number one focus was get customers. Uh, so we had a, uh, the president, the CEO had a, a, a so saying. Let me ask you a specific question. Yeah. Um, OK, so you have an agreement with your investors, and you don't obey. You don't obey to, to this agreement. What happens? Ah, uh, well, that you wasn't part the rules, you know? Yeah. Um, so we never got, so we never followed through with the investment. Um, never what? We never took the money. So we never actually went, entered a contract with the, okay. and uh, with the convertible note, they're giving you money. And I, as far as I know, that's the end of anything. And then it converts and then you have a formal relationship. You have the obligation of convert, but maybe if you are in bad faith, you don't convert. Oh. You want to be Right, right. Um, it gets. I think we, it gets. I don't. I don't. I never heard of that. I think what because what happens. Uh, so your agreements get once you take on investment, they get filed with the the federal government, and so then it. If you try to get another round of investment then they would uncover that. And they wouldn't give you money if you decided not to do that. So I, I think, yeah. So I think in the States, the market kind of solves that level of, of problems. Um, 
in terms of other ways we could have done things, I don't know. I can only tell you we we had heard met from like we'd sit in communities like this, and it was dude, Sorry, don't no you don't have anything for anybody to want. Like, don't worry about it. Um, and and for us too, it was kind of a concern because we're working with students, right? So let's say we connect a student to an employee employer, and that employer is really you know, not a good, it's something bad happens. We talked it over and said, we, that's not, liable or not. We didn't think we personally would be liable. The company would be liable. But worst case, that company doesn't exist anymore. And we learned that that wasn't a good company and that wasn't a good risk to take. Else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, bootstrapping. We weren't making any money because uh, we decided to do it for free connect people. We wanted to build a platform. There's so many employers, so many students, and this is the place. And then when it's the place, then people would pay. Um, and there's some value to that. There's some concepts that that might work, but for our situation, it didn't work because we needed money. So we couldn't bootstrap something that was only would work if it would get big. And so one more piece of advice, and then we could talk over pizza, is if your idea needs to be huge for it to be valuable, Oh man, I wouldn't do it. I mean, so <laughs> <laughs> create value all along the way, and you don't have to make money all along the way, but you should be investing in something that could reap value if you don't become the biggest, the next social. I, I, I'm very curious about why they, they called off the agreement, the investors. Oh, uh, because my co founder left. Huh? My co founder left. Oh, they, they called off because they left. Yeah, so they, they would always say team, traction, and idea in that order. Oh, okay, so the team was out. The team was gone. It was a problem. And I, I had a good face and a <laughs> wonderful smile and charm, but uh, no team. Uh, and so they, they, they didn't want to do it. Which, which uh, just uh, real quick, I know, until no, he gets not, expelled, okay. until he got expelled, is that <laughs> this idea that you mentioned to have this agreement about the objective, I think it's very good when you have a team and you say, hey, you and, you know, you and I, let's have a startup, but Let's work that much time, and if we make this thing happen, then we keep we keep going, right? So we have some s kind of social contract going on. Yeah. So you don't drop in the middle, or I don't drop in the middle of the road. So that's what I think is a good. And another, I won't interpret the lesson, but these two guys were buddies. They worked together at Microsoft, and as it turned out, in that last month that we were all a trio, they were having weekly discussions without me about. Yeah what should they do next? <laughs> so, um, so as you pick your team, I don't know what you should do, but I know that it was interesting to have an unequal balance of like relationships where their tie was really strong and their tie to me was fairly weak. Um, it worked out. They were the best co-founders I could have had and they left, um, we all left on good terms. They just didn't want to do this anymore and I didn't want to do it four or five months and later. But and now I'm curious about why did they Dropped. If we were talking with the investors about uh, uh, all this money, yeah, this thing, it looks like a success. success. Yeah, they success thought. So what he told me was he didn't see the path. So he's like, I can't see three steps to where I'm paying those guys back and making them a big return. And so he didn't want the handcuffs of, wow, I just got uh, four hundred thousand dollars, and this is my first time getting investment in Seattle. I. I have to work for 10 years now on to make that success. Um, and that's a scary thing too. That's what you have to do. You have to be ready to work 10 years on your idea. And that's why I also don't think that I'm going to founder again. Yeah. May I? You talk, uh, speak about the, the team. You've talked about the, the weekly goals. Yeah. Why? What happens to to this thing uh, so important? So I equate it to, um, let's say you're trying to get to um, Copacabana from here. And you say, boom, my goal is to get to Copacabana. And you're like, sure, let's do it. And I'm leading you there. And uh, we just start walking. And I'm like, guys, we're getting closer to Copacabana. And Fabio turns to me and says, I don't think we are. Uh, and I'm like, no, we're, it's cool. We're, we're getting there. Uh, so if you have weekly checkups, it's like GPS. Uh, your phone's going to say, hey, you turned left when you should have turned right. Uh, 
get spring. get back. What's it? Oh, spring. It's a uh, agile uh, methodology to to software for software developments. Yeah. With periodically uh, uh, goals check. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so you want those from a customer side, maybe even from an investor side. Uh, we had two sets of customers, students and employers, so we should have had goals for each of those. And just every week say, hey, you know, you said next week you were going to get two new customers. We didn't get any. Then at least we could say, why not? Um, that's our way to get our GPS to say, take a right. It's like, well, and <laughs> looking back, it's hilarious what we, some of the stuff we put out. <laughs> we had a one-page advertisement. Somebody's like, hey, give us a one-pager. And it had so many words on it, and it's embarrassing, but it, I should frame it because it's like, this is what you do when you're running around with it, like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, so we could have said, look, we're not getting customers because we have this one pager with more stuff than anybody will ever read. Um, so anyway, you can start to think about what are the reasons why you're off target.